So it's go. Where is that from? I can't get it out of my head. Fam of the Opera. Oh my gosh, you're totally right. Thank you, man. I've been like struggling with that for like a day. We have that in common. Like we're both like music people. Um, I grew up playing the violin and the viola, and you, you're musical as well. Um, yeah. Let me try to remember. Oh, so you play the tuba. Nope, that's not wrong. Uh, trombone. Nope. Saxophone. Nope. Bassoon. No. French horn. No. It's the flute. No, it's the bassoon. I don't remember what. what. Trumpet. Oh, yeah. that was like, that you're, was, you're it really was right in, of my tongue. It was almost there. You really insulted me with saxophone. <laughs> Everything else I could take, but not uh, saxophone. Wait, that's not the same thing? They're pretty close. They're, pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> they're both made of metal, right? <laughs> that's right. There they are. Yeah, yeah. They're, that's right. Yeah. This week's core ultrasound image review brings back another special guest that we had. Ben Smith, MD. We are recording this in his backyard. It is just a beautiful day. We had to do it outside. We talk about a couple of fast exam pearls as well as some echo pearls. While these applications might be a bit on the basic side, it's not super cutting edge stuff. I think that this is very important to keep in mind when evaluating your patient in the emergency department and really in any clinical setting in which you're examining patients. I mean, every field of medicine can be assisted by ultrasound when trying to figure out the diagnosis except for maybe pathology. I don't know yet of too many pathologists using ultrasound, but everybody else can use ultrasound. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Check it out. So Ben Smith, Ben Smith, MD, besides being a trumpet master, you also fly remote control airplanes. Uh You are a nuclear engineer. You build sheds. You also (laughs) learn... It's a great shed, by the way. That's right. You also coded the entire Core Ultrasound website. So what do you not do? Oh, and you do ultrasound stuff, obviously. That's right. Um, what do I not do? Um, let me think. Uh, I, can't, I can't surf. Mm, we got one thing. I can't uh, do the sports. <laughs> <laughs> you can't play sport ball. That's right, yeah. Sport ball, any sport ball. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I have this uh, kind of uh, Mr. Burns style body. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think that you have much more, like significantly more positives than negatives. <laughs> uh, ben Smith, we have him for the second week. And we're wearing these same exact clothes as last week, which is like kind of incredible that we're able to coordinate that. Same weather. Yep. Same I kids outside. It is amazing. Last week. Yeah, that's that's true. Slightly different angle, though. I mean, like it is a slightly different angle because uh, my camera died and Ben was able to let me use his. And camera. because it's a new week. And because it's a new week, I drove from Lexington, <laughs> Again, which is where I'm right. from, right. down to Chattanooga, where is uh, where Ben's from, and it, he is the ultrasound director at the University of Tennessee Department of Emergency Medicine at Erlanger Hospital, where. He does ultrasound stuff. And do you mind if we go through a couple of ultrasound cases like let's we did it. last week? Sure, let's do it. Let's go through another set of clips. Let's look at this bad boy right here. What What do you see here, Ben? So uh, why uh, why is the bladder next to the kidney? Right next to it. That's what it looks like to me. That That's is like- <laughs> very, yeah, this definitely looks like bladder with a little bit of urine in it. That's right. If this patient were to get a bladder infection, Immediate pilo. That's right. Because but, they're but, literally touching. But if they were, if it, but if they were passing a kidney stone, it would take literally twenty seconds. Boom, he passed. They wouldn't even know it. That's right. They wouldn't even know it. That's it would right. just like they're just peeing. I'd be like, oh, there's another one. No pain yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. So there's like uh, sort of a middle echoic, uh-huh. right here, flowing fluid type stuff next to the kidney. There. Any any context on this uh, image? This is a blunt abdominal trauma patient, sick looking, hypotensive. This is a right upper quadrant view. All right, so uh, yeah, that that looks like uh, older blood or blood that's been there for a while. Like yeah, it, it's so is that why it's not perfectly hypoechoic like we're used to seeing? Yeah, 
Yeah, like fresh blood is going to be like totally anechoic. And if you mm-hmm. have uh, acute you know, trauma from the field and they're relatively recently developed hemoperitoneum, it's going to be anechoic. But if it's been sitting there for a while or if it's a large amount like this mm-hmm. starting to sort of organize, turn into a clot. This is like tr- trying to get clotty. Yeah. I think is how I would describe this blood. Brilliant. Love it. <sighs> ben, this one was very humbling for me. You know, I've done quite a bit of ultrasounds. I did the fellowship. Um, I've been the ultrasound director for a bit. And I was wrong here. Now, this is a pelvis view. This is a sagittal view. Pro marker facing up. It's this way. Bladder. A little uterus right here. And look at this thing right here. I mean, this is something that looks to me, and looked to me at the time, like a positive pelvic fast. What do you think of it? Yeah, it's in the right location for, for free flu in the belly. And it is like relatively hypoechoic. And you know, in, in a setting of a blunt abdominal trauma, I would be hard pressed to not call that a positive. One thing that would be important is if, if you have this much flu in the belly, I would expect to see it other places like Morrison's pouch. Yeah, it was negative. I mean, that's actually a great point. Right upper quadrant was negative. Left upper quadrant was leg- negative. And that's something that I didn't think about at the time. If you're this positive in the pelvis, you should be positive on your spots. Absolutely right. Additionally, this patient was relatively stable. Like this was somebody that had a high enough mechanism that we were doing the ultrasound, but wasn't super sick. So mild abdominal pain in reality and uh, normal vitals. So what we do, and this is something you know, kind of like about the FAST exam, is that it's not there to replace the CT scanner, right? So we have a hemodynamically stable patient with a positive FAST. We should we send that person to the CT scanner because we get more information with that CT scanner than we would with the ultrasound. And what if you know the patient has um, a bladder injury and an aorta? injury both leaking like both of those can cause issues so that's why i think the ct scanner is like perfectly reasonable especially in this patient so we got the ct scan and i was expecting them to say oh yeah it was positive crazy the patient was hemodynamically stable and was still positive and we got the cat scan and it was negative Hmm. for any free fluid you were hoping to be able to do one of these like yeah yeah i really thought i was gonna be like see i told you guys i told (laughs) you so it turns out that that was just a giant poop ball huh here is a ct scan do you have some tips for me, man? I mean, what could I have done besides what you mentioned about right upper quadrant, you know, look there first. What other tips do you have to help me not make this mistake again in the future? Well, you know, when I, whenever I see what I think is free fluid in the belly, mm-hmm. think about how that fluid would go when it is actually true hemoperitoneum. When it's free fluid, it's going to go between the structures. And so normally, it's be like have more corners? Right. Okay. Yeah, kind of like more sort of like sharp edges, the potential space between... For instance, Morrison's pouch is going to be a little slice, a little triangle there okay. sort of shape. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this is pretty round looking. And I've seen the same thing when you're looking, for instance, the left upper quadrant, that if you see a round structure full of fluid, it's probably, you know, the, the stomach. Or in the right upper quadrant, you can have the same thing. And that, that, you know, as you fan through that hypochoic circle is actually a blind pouch. So that's the gallbladder. Hmm. And so... It's kind of roundish, but it's kind I, of encapsulated. Yeah, is what kind, you're saying like, it kind of like is. it's kind of like a nice circle right here. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. So it's like basically it's the sigmoid colon is what yeah. I'm looking at right Although, here. Although right? if I saw this, I'm not sure I wouldn't have called it positive. Also, so. oh, thanks, man. You, I mean, yeah. after all these years, I mean, I was a resident from 2012 to 2015, so five years ago. Yeah, you're still nurturing, you're <laughs> still encouraging. It's great, man. This is perfect. That's actually the first time that I said that you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Next, this is something that I think we uncovered when I was a resident. Like, I remember like discovering this and being like in awe because this is something that can be a foil for a positive FAST exam. Now, I'm not, we're going to talk about this or what, what's going on over here in a little bit, but what I want to talk about is this right here. I'm actually going to pause it and we are going to move to right here. This, we just talked about that you want fluid to be kind of pointy for it to be considered free fluid. This is a little bit pointy, right? What do you make of this fluid right here? Let's say this is the right upper quadrant. Let's say this is the inferior pole of the kidney. I mean, that's where free fluid should be, right? Is this not a positive fast? Well, it's so closely hugging the the kidney. It makes me think that it's pericapsular. Like it, it it doesn't look like it's in the belly. It looks, it's probably retroperitoneal. It even actually goes 
you can see it right. I'm gonna take control of the cursor. Mm -hmm. Where's please the cursor? Do, please do, right there. You can see it right here, even like going. Like, all the, it's like surrounding it. It is. Yeah, and then that with this mess that's going on on the inside, some pretty good hydro. It's at least moderate hydro, right? Yep. At least. Yep. What would that equal? So it makes me think that something has happened with that kidney where fluid is extravasating around it. Exactly. And what's what, what about the hydro has caused fluid to extravasate around it? Yeah, so what this is is calyx heel rupture, which can happen huh. when you have bad hydro. I think about it as sometimes you have such bad backup that one of the little pyramids that are now, you know, fluids backed up into it just like pops out. And then the fluid is now leaking into, is it Gerota's fascia? Gerota's fascia? I might be wrong. It's some kind of fascia that encapsulates the kidney. And if you see this, it's calyx heel rupture. And the classic kind of presentation of this is the patient will have really bad pain, really bad, really bad pain. And then they'll have a moment where they have less pain because they have less kind of backup pressure pushing on their kidney because now they have some release of that pressure. It's an interesting finding, I think. Did this patient have that? Yes. And you would tell the patient, um, the good news is we found, out, we found out what the cause of your pain is. The bad news is your kidney exploded. Your kidney, like, well, <laughs> a piece of your kidney exploded. Just only part of thing. it. Just part of your kidney exploded. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite findings there. Ooh, you know, I, I see it. one of my favorite findings. There's so many, these are my favorite findings. <laughs> this is one of my favorite findings as well. Now, we'll say, before we talk about exactly what's, it's a little dark, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, we'll say, before I talk about what's going on, I want to talk about this view. Now, this is not a textbook classic apical four chamber view. If you look here, the axis of the heart is kind of tilted. And really to get a good apical four chamber view, you want to have the septum kind of right in the middle or at least straight up and down. The problem with that view is that sometimes, especially when you have this, which is an enlarged right heart, you can't get the entire heart into view, especially the right side of the heart. So you have to do what's called an RV modified view, where you basically tilt the transducer to focus more on the right heart. Typically, we want to focus on the left heart, but here we're trying to focus on the right heart. And there's another finding here that we we actually, probably two or three years ago, we podcasted about this specific finding. Do you want to remind me what it is? I have bad memory. That's the McConnell sign. What? Right here. AKA apical wink, mm -hmm. which is a sign of, of bad right side of heart strain. Like that, that RV is hurting right now. Yeah. Does it mean a PE every single time? No. What? Well, I, th it's been described. What? It was described originally in PE patients. Okay. And originally, like, when it was described, it was, like, 99% you know, specific for PE. Obviously, poorly sensitive. These would be in your sure. submassive or bigger PEs. But but they've also found that the McConnell sign can be present per cardiology's echocardiography read in patients who have, you know, some chronic pH causes. So chronic pulmonary hypertension. So mm -hmm. patients who have COPD with core pulmonalis can sometimes see a McConnell sign. Right. Um, and again, clinical context, this is like a young patient on birth control pills, mm -hmm. sudden onset of shortness of breath and hypotension. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's like a PE as far as I'm concerned. That's very suggestive. Right. Yeah. So if you take everybody that gets an echo, McConnell sign is not specific. Right. But if you take patients in whom you have a pretest probability of a PE, this is very specific. So it's all about how you utilize the test, right? Yep. yep. Was that called? Hazian, Kazian. Bayesian. 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 Nice. I was going to like go like like I did with the musical instruments. I do all the letters except for B. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for correcting me um, earlier on that one. The last one is one that we see this fairly frequently. And when I look at this, I go, ugh. <laughs> ugh. Ugh. Usually what I say when I see this. <laughs> um, what, what, do we, what do we got here, Ben? Uh, you have a incredibly lazy left ventricle. <laughs> Needs that, to get a job. Yeah, they need, that left ventricle needs a job. Like, look at the. First of all, if you've looked at plenty of echoes, you can see that there's relatively uh, almost no change in the LV lumen size between right systole and diastole. It's just almost nothing there. So and then look at the mitral valve and see, like, it's just barely puffing open. And so. Like a little bird's beak. Yeah. And so you think about, like, into the LV, blood in equals blood out. That little puff of blood going into the LV is like a mm. little. Like a little 
like a little yeah. tiny puff of blood. Yeah. So my guess is the stroke volume is incredibly low. This patient mm-hmm. has severe CHF. Yeah. This is a really bad... Is this patient even alive? <laughs> like, I've seen patients that, with echoes like this who are pulseless. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I've also seen patients that are like this that are here for chronic back pain that has nothing right. to do with their echo. Some yep. people like live with an injection fraction of like five to 10. That's right. You know, I mean, I don't think a lot of them do. Um, but yeah, so this is um, a very low ejection fraction. It's a perishional long axis view. We have the left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, aortic valve, aortic outflow tract, and the right ventricular outflow tract with a descending aorta right here kind of coming at you question for you when you have a patient and you're thinking does this patient have copd or do they have chf we all know that auscultation doesn't work very well to differentiate between the two do you go straight for the echo first how do you evaluate a patient with copd versus chf well you know if they have a known history of chf i'm not going to be able to like look at this and say are their ef is say 10 percent worse than it was before i know they've got chf yeah i'm going to the lungs really are the lungs wet or not that's what the question i'm that's the question you really want to know. Yeah, and I always say that. Like, this person, who knows? Maybe they, today, they went to Walmart, they went home, they had their bag of chips or whatever to increase their salt so that their, you know, heart failure gets worse or whatever. And they came in, and the reason that they're there today has nothing to do with their heart, right? Nothing to do with their heart whatsoever. But to really tell... You don't really have symptoms necessarily, especially at rest, without the congestion in the lungs, right? That's right. Yeah, so we look for uh, B-lines versus A-lines to kind of help the difference between is this the problem today or is this not the problem today? That's right. And so you can tell, are the lungs dry or wet? And I I still do listen to them, and I think that, you know, you can have cardiac wheezing, yes, but if they have COPD, they're wheezing on ultrasound, they've got dry lungs. I'm thinking that's most likely bronchospasm of course, in that of patient. Course. And if I see B-lines diffusely in the patient that's you know hypoxic and really short of breath, mm. then and that's really suggestive of a decompensated heart failure. And their echo may even look the same or even better as it, than it did before, yeah. but they could still be in decompensated congestive heart failure in that setting. Ben, thanks so much for stopping by in your own house uh, <laughs> uh, and going through image review for us. Um, hopefully we can do this again soon. Chattanooga yeah. is a wonderful city. And if not, we can always Zoom it or Google Hangouts it, right? Yeah, yeah. if people uh, enjoy these, we can do some some virtual image interpretation. It would be, be great. I'd Agreed. Agreed. Thanks right, for coming man. by. Thank you. So to recap, we have a very positive fast exam with fluid that isn't quite as hypoechoic as we might be used to seeing. And when I see that, I often think that there might actually be older blood. I'm not saying like a Dale, but older blood that might already start to be going along the row two coagulation. In the pelvis, sometimes a big poop ball might give you a false positive fast. That was a humbling experience for me. The key is, is to look for rounded edges. Usually fluid that is contained within a structure has a kind of round border around it. Whereas if it's free fluid, it often is going to be kind of jagged in appearance because it's just kind of filling in the spaces in between the intestines. Additionally, if you're not sure, look at other views and of course, clinically correlate. Let's say you have a patient with acute flank pain or acute abdominal pain, and you ultrasound them in the right upper quadrant. And let's say you see a rim of fluid all the way around the kidney in the setting of a patient with hydronephrosis and suspicion of a ureterolithiasis, that could be calocele rupture or urine within the capsule of the kidney. And finally, a couple echo things. Don't forget McConnell sign does not always mean that the patient has an acute PE. However, if you have a high pretest probability that your patient has a PE and you see right heart strain with McConnell sign, it's very likely to be a PE. But if you take all comers who get an echo, the McConnell sign is not necessarily that specific for a PE because other things can cause acute right heart strain besides a PE. And classic, the low ejection fraction on your ultrasound. If you are wondering if that low ejection fraction is a cause of your patient's shortness of breath, 
check out the lungs. Your patient is unlikely to be short of breath from a heart failure exacerbation unless they have fluid in their lungs. So look for the fluid in the lungs, look for bee lines in the lungs. That concludes this number five core ultrasound, episode five. In episode six, we're going to be back here in Lexington, Kentucky, where I am the ultrasound director. And we're going to have Taryn Trot, who's the co-host, as well as Aaron Tiagi, who's a new EM critical care attending at the University of Kentucky. Hopefully, I'll see you there and happy scanning.